Does God know everything? Our quick answer is, oh yeah, God knows everything. Is there anything that God cannot know? That may be a little different question. Now, it seems like the two are very similar, but there's a little slight difference between them. Let's ask this question. Was Jesus God while He was upon this earth? Yes. Absolutely. We know that from Matthew 1, verse 23, right? He will be called Emmanuel, and the Bible tells us what that means. God with us. Hmm. Does God know everything? Is there anything God doesn't know? Jesus was God while He was upon the face of this earth. Did Jesus know everything? No, He did not. Ah. Now you see where I'm going with this. I'm not trying to be a radical. I'm not trying to be, you know, stir the pot up. But I want us to think about some things because sometimes we think about things by, by what's been said and, and all down through the years. And we need to be people who think for ourselves. And we need to realize that uh, some things are just a little bit wrong, it may be, in the way that we say them. And I say possibly. So if Jesus was God, but He didn't know everything because Matthew 24, 36 tells us that He didn't know when the final judgment day was going to be. And He said the even the angels in heaven didn't know. Well, that makes sense, doesn't it? Because Jesus was in heaven before He came to this world. His name was the Word. And notice in Revelation, when He's back in heaven, that's what He's called again, the Word. That was His name. He said only His Father knew. The Holy Spirit didn't know. Jesus didn't know. The angels didn't know. If we are dealing with someone who has not studied the Scriptures as they ought to, they would say, ooh, here's a contradiction. But a contradiction is only a contradiction if there is no possible explanation. This isn't a contradiction. So how do you answer it? Obviously, there was something that God chose not to know. Does that make sense? Jesus was God here on earth, but He said He didn't know. Only the Father knew. And yet the Godhead worked together to devise the world that we live in, to devise a plan of salvation because they knew that once man was given his free choice that sooner or later, and it didn't take long, they're going to violate God's law and they would need a Savior. This is something that uh, you caused me to think about this, uh, William, uh, in your sermon Sunday. Because I've long believed that God can, if He so chooses, not to know something. And there are a number of passages in the Old Testament, but I never saw it with regard to Jesus. Here was God, but He didn't know something. Let me give you one example. In Genesis chapter 22, uh, you remember in that chapter, Abraham was commanded by God to take his son and to take him to Mount Moriah and offer him as a sacrifice. Abraham immediately obeyed. As soon as he woke up the next morning, they're gone. So the, the journey to the mount, they built the altar. He laid his son on the altar. 
picked up the knife and was going to plunge it into his son's chest. But God said, Lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him, for now I know that thou fearest God. Seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. Did you catch that? Abraham was ready to take the life of his son because God said, do it. God has put a test to Abraham. And Abraham passed the test because he was, real, he was actually going to do it. In fact, the Hebrew letter tells us uh, that he did offer his son and received him back from the dead. He was so sure in his mind that he would take his son's life. Now I know that thou fearest God. Why, God? Because you wouldn't withhold your only son. By the way, the uh, the uh, uh, phrase there, thy son, is the indication of only of a kind. The same word we have, only begotten, uh, the original word in the New Testament. Uh, same, same concept. There's only one of a kind. Abraham only had one son, one child, period, from his legitimate wife. Jesus was the only one of his kind. Isn't that interesting how God takes the preparation from the Old Testament and brings it into the New? So I've given you something to think about. And I can see by a few looks on some few faces that, uh-oh, wait a minute. Any comments? Hmm. Oh, well. Let's turn over to Acts 16 and we'll continue our study in Acts. We remember in this chapter, there's a young maid, a young girl, and she has the ability to what we would call soothsay, to tell the future in a sense, to tell things about people that, you know, absolutely true that maybe nobody else knew. We would call her today a fortune teller. But we see her uh, constantly grieving Paul. She's saying this over and over and over. What was she saying over and over and over? I think the weather must have froze everybody's brain. <laughs> These men are the servants of the Most High God who proclaim to us the way of salvation. Yeah, these are God's servants. And they are telling us the way of salvation. Hmm. Over and over and over. Wouldn't you get tired of that if somebody followed you around and said the same thing over and over about you, no matter what it was? Well, this went on for several days. And Paul finally said, enough's enough. And he got rid of the demon. She no longer was the mouthpiece. Her mouth was no longer the mouthpiece for this demon. And that's where we pick up in verse 19. And when her masters saw that the hope of their gains was gone, they caught Paul and Silas and drew them unto the marketplace under the rulers. The marketplace was the place where their courts were held. Under the Old Testament, uh, especially in the patriarchal and mosaic age, a lot of time the court was held at the city gate. Uh, among the people of that time. But in this time, the marketplace was the place uh, where they went and court was held. And brought them to the magistrates, saying, These men, being Jews, do exceedingly trouble our city, and teach customs which are not lawful for us to receive, neither to observe being Romans. Now notice, 
what was it that got them all upset? They weren't going to make any more money off this little girl. She couldn't tell things about people, tell the future or whatever it was that uh, she was telling about people. She couldn't do that anymore. And obviously, they were charging money for this, gains, and so they got upset. Oh, what the love of money will do. They didn't proclaim the real reason. Notice they took Paul and Silas to who? The magistrates. Where were they? In the marketplace. Their court. And they didn't tell them the real reason. They didn't say, these guys are costing us our money. They're costing us our livelihood. Hit a man in his wallet, and you've made an enemy. Their excuses for rioting are, are often substituted for the real reason. They knew if they went to the magistrate and said, oh, you know, they're, they're taking our money away from us. They've, they've healed this, this young girl, and, and now she can't tell the fortunes of people, and we don't make any money. They knew they'd be thrown out right away. So what did they use as an excuse? What charges did they put forth? Here's an ancient case of troublemakers in our city. That's what they said. These are troublemakers. Why? They're teaching things that, that are unlawful for us to do. Now, unless we get behind the scene and, and do some studying about this, we think, well, what unlawful things are they teaching? Under Roman law, it got to a point where the Roman law made it wrong to worship any other god except the emperor. Oh, it was all right if you wanted to worship the god of the Jews, uh, but Christianity, they got to thinking, is an offshoot of the Jewish religion, so now it became illegal. Any new religion, old religions, okay, you can go ahead and worship them if you want to. But you better put emperor first. Then you can worship your local gods that have always been worshipped by your people. Christianity was now something that was pretty well banned. You follow the money. That's where the real problem was. And when you stop and think about this, notice something else that was involved there. Here is an ancient example of exactly the same things that go on today. Look at it again. And when her masters saw that the hope of their gains was gone, they caught Paul and Silas and drew them into the marketplace under the rulers. Now watching. And brought them to the magistrate, saying, These men being, what? Jews. Jews. Ooh. Do you see racism there? It's nothing new in our time. Why, these men are Jews. We're Romans. We're better than they are. These men being Jews do exceedingly trouble our city. And they teach things that aren't lawful for us. It's not lawful for us to hear about Christ. When you think about what took place in those times, this riot that was caused... How often are riots generally started by a lie? Stop and think about it. We've seen a lot of that in the last five years, or really three years, a little more than three years. 
where lies have been used to get people to riot in the streets and without them stopping to think and to investigate to find the truth, they just go along with it. That's what we're going to see now. Look at verse 22. And the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates rent off their clothes and commanded to beat them. Oh, the multitude rose up together? Oh, what were the managers, so to speak, the masters of this little girl doing? Why, they're going around screaming. They're, they're, they're trying to get us to teach things that are contrary to the law. Didn't tell them the real reason. And they were able to gather a multitude. Oh, why? Because in many of these cities, if they had colony status, if you said something against the government or caused a riot, you can be put to death. And more than likely would be. Hmm. The multitude rose up against them, and the magistrates rent off their clothes. A false charge is basically made based on race and national pride. And the mob reacted without digging into the facts. Didn't do any investigating. Oh, this, uh, this really sounds serious. We've, we've got to do something. We've got to protest this. And that's how mob violence so often starts. And the more inflammatory the accusation can be, the better. And that's exactly what, this was very inflammatory in their time and in their city. Now notice something else. These magistrates, they're also influenced by the truth? No, by the mob. They see the mob and, and the mob reacting and, and they get all excited. They didn't investigate the charges. They didn't conduct a trial. And they certainly did not allow the defendants to defend themselves. Didn't even give them an opportunity. Hmm. Remember something right here. Paul is a born Roman citizen. Hmm. He wasn't made a Roman citizen because he led a conquering army. He wasn't made a Roman citizen because uh, he did some great work that benefited Rome. He was born in a city where you few were born in that city. Tarsus. You were a Roman citizen. Instead of investigating, finding out the facts, what did the magistrates do? They, in essence, joined the violent mob. It says that magistrates rent off their clothes. That isn't talking about the magistrates ripping their own clothes off. Remember the Jews many times under uh, the old, uh, patriarchal law before they became Jews and, and even under the Jewish law would sometimes rent their garments off as, as a, a sign of just, oh, this is terrible. This is, this, whatever's taking place is just absolutely horrible. It's, it, oh, no. Romans didn't do that. This is talking about Paul and Silas's clothes. They ripped them off. Why? Because of what they're going to do next. They commanded them to be beaten. This command was unlawful for several reasons. First of all, because it was unjust, it was based on, on a lie, and there had been no trial. Much worse, according to Roman law, they beat an uncondemned Roman citizen. There was not much worse 
as far as Roman law was concerned, then to do that treason was probably about the only thing that really was, was worse in the eyes of Romans than to have a citizen of Rome beaten without trial, without uh, being condemned by a court. Innocent men were shamefully treated, badly beaten and cast into prison because of a, of a created mob based on a lie. Now look ahead a little more. Verse 23 and 24. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely, who, having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in the stocks. Beaten with how many stripes? Many, right? Do, do any of the other translations use a different word? Other than many? many. Huh? Many. Just many? many? Okay. I couldn't remember if there, that was the case or not. Have enough trouble remembering the King James, much less all these other versions. Uh, how would they be beaten? They're bare back. Hmm. Under Jewish law, they could have only been beaten with 40 stripes minus one. Make, Got to make sure you don't accidentally go over that 40 under Jewish law. This was probably, under Jewish law, what we would call a cat of nine tails. But the Romans didn't administer a beating that way. The Romans usually administered the beatings with a rod. It'd be something like, um, say, a half-inch dowel rod. Now think about that. Half-inch dowel rod. If I had one of them up here, which one of you would volunteer to let me beat you with it? Just, just one, one hit. Just one hit. Anybody? Uh-oh. I would ask, but I'm not going to. <laughs> Anybody volunteer for that? I didn't think so. Do you remember a few years ago in uh, Singapore, there was a teenage boy who was sentenced to be beaten by the court for violations of the laws of Singapore. Of course, Americans got all bent out of shape. You can't do this, blah, 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 blah. You do the crime, you pay the penalty. That's the way it should be. He was stealing signs, road signs. Now, in our country, you say, well, stealing a road sign, now, that could be pretty bad if it's a four-way stop and somebody thinks they don't have to stop now and they go barreling through and hit somebody, uh, some, somebody could die, right? Well, in, in, in Singapore, it's even more important because it's such a small island city, government, country. And when you start stealing these signs, you're going to have multiple wrecks all over the place. His room was filled with them. Oh, that wasn't told to the American public. But I knew about it because I was over there. And the people told me what had been found in his room. Well, he eventually got cane, but less than normal. But you know what? Something interesting came from all that. That boy was very much a hoodlum, as we would think of it. But when he came back to the United States, guess what? He completely turned his life around. He learned a valuable lesson. The Roman beating would have been very much like the caning uh, that is, takes place in some places in our, in our world today. About a half inch, maybe three quarter inch dowel rod. 
and being beaten by this with many stripes would have bruised the people, would have bruised Paul. It also would have caused lesions to open up and they would bleed and need a care which they'll get later. These beatings were administered by a person called the lector. I bet you've studied about the lector, haven't you? The lector carried with him a bundle of sticks with an axe head in it, all bound up. And these were the tools of execution. If a beating was to take place, they unbound, they took a rod, and they beat the person with it. If his head was to come off, then they used the axe and they cut his head off. They were a symbol of power and authority. And the lector would have been the one who had be was beating Paul and Silas. And the number of stripes, the number of, of, of hits, so to speak, would have been determined by the magistrates and it was at their discretion. It could be a few or it could be many. It could be so many that the person would end up dying at the beating that they was receiving. So after they did all of this illegal activity, and by the way, I've often wondered if Silas may also have been a freeborn Roman citizen, but I can't, I can't prove that. I can, Paul. Uh, did you have a comment? I would just say the likelihood is. I think the likelihood was. So it wouldn't be just one Roman citizen they beat illegally. It would have been two if we're right in that. They cast them into prison. <laughs> you ever been in a prison in the United States? Now, unless it's the worst of the worst, it's absolutely amazing. Jenny and I went on a tour of a prison in West Virginia. A friend of ours was uh, served as a chaplain in the uh, prison and he was able to get us in and walk around. I couldn't believe what we saw. Some of the cellmates had televisions. Almost all of them had radios. They had posters up on the walls. Some of them not very nice to look at. They had a gymnasium that most high schools would die to have. And they had a weight equipment that was unbelievable. I mean, all of the latest, best stuff and lots of it. And their meals, they, I'm sure they complained about it, but they weren't bad. Hmm. Not so a Roman prison. In fact, in Roman prisons, if you didn't have somebody to help you in some way, to provide you some of the things you needed, most Roman prisons, uh, you'll probably starve to death. And they told the jailer, now you keep them safely. Who? Paul and Silas. Keep them safely. In other words, basically it says, you better not let them escape. You better not let these men are, in other words, implied, are so terrible, so horrible, they don't need to be on the outside. You better not let them escape. What was the penalty for a Roman soldier who allowed a prisoner to escape? Come on, y'all know. Death. Death. In fact, we're going to see this Roman soldier, this guard of the gate uh, of the prison, He's going to react in a way because he knows what the penalty is for letting a prisoner escape. And because he received this charge, the text says, he cast them, he thrust them into the inner prison. Violently pushed them, threw them, whatever he had to do to violently get them in the inner prison. Uh, but what's the inner prison? Imagine with me, if you will, three boxes. Each box bigger 
uh, than the other three. Imagine, first of all, you have an inner box and then an outer box around that box and then the third box around that box. The middle area between the inner and outer, that was a walkway. That was the place to walk prisoners back and forth or wherever they're going to go or to the magistrates or, or whatever. The outer section was the outer prison where the prisoners that, you know, they're, they've been bad, but they're not the real bad ones. The inner prison was the place where Paul and Silas were put. It's not a good place at all. We would liken it today to solitary confinement where a prisoner is put in a cell where there are no windows, only blank walls, where the opening door is made in such a way that a tray of food can be slid underneath and then that sh little door shut, or a ho opening where uh, they can open it up and he sticks his hands through and they put cuffs on him and then take him out somewhere to wherever he's going and a little window that they can open up, but all those openings are normally closed. And the prisoner is inside that room. That's what this inner prison would have been like. Now, let's watch what happens. He also did something to their feet. He made their feet fast in stocks. If you've ever visited uh, uh, some of the old uh, revolutionary cities uh, and they've restored parts of the cities, you might find a place where there are stocks. Now, the most common one that we s normally see is the one where, you know, you put your head and your hands in and then they put the wood down and you're, you're stuck inside of it, right? But there was another kind of stock and it was put on the feet. And this was an additional precaution. It would be like putting leg irons on uh, a prisoner today. This was an additional precaution taken so that the prisoner can't escape. But it was also another method of torture. The Romans were fa unbelievably good at torture. It produced leg cramps. You couldn't move your legs around. You ever had a leg cramp? I get a lot of them, and they're not fun at all, are they? So you see, everything in the Roman system for punishment was designed to torture. You're tortured in a room, no windows, no light, dank, musty, wet, cold, in leg stocks. Oh, what a mean guy that jailer was, huh? No, no, wait a minute. Are we judging the jailer a little too harshly? Uh, remember, this was his job just to, to hold prisoners. He was bound by rules that you do it this way and, and you take care of them. Well, we sit back and we say, no, wait a minute. That's the excuse that was used in the Nuremberg trials, wasn't it? Well, this was just our job. That's why we killed all these Jews. Well, he could have chosen some other profession, couldn't he? Maybe, maybe not. And when he saw the many stripes and the bruises and, and probably the open wounds that, that had to have existed by a beating of many stripes, he probably assumed they, they, they've got to be really dangerous men. They've really got, they, they've got to be really bad. Hmm. So what happened? Well, look at verse 25 and 26. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. 
And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so the found foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were open and everyone's bands were loosed. At midnight, what are Paul and Silas doing? <laughs> they're praying and they're singing praises to God. Let's ask ourselves a question. And it's easy for us here to say, oh, I, I would have done it. I, I would have done the same thing. <laughs> would we? How do we usually feel when we get hurt real bad? Do we feel happy and joyous and, and, and you know, or somebody does some, some really mean thing to us? Maybe even hurts us. Do we feel like praying and singing? Paul and Silas weren't moaning in pain, although they had every right to be. We don't understand in our time just how serious these, these beatings were that the Romans administered. Uh, they weren't cursing the jailer and magistrates or the mob and all those horrible, rotten, dirty, nasty people. They, they shouldn't do this to us. What'd we do? Uh-uh, we weren't having a pity party. Instead, they were singing songs of praise to God. They were offering up petitions to God. We don't have any details of those prayers, but I would imagine that they prayed for everything to be all right, to survive this injustice that was happening to them. And do you think maybe they were thanking God that they were counted worthy of suffering for Him? They praised God who had allowed these things to happen to them. A lot of people in our time and in all ages, man, if bad things happen to us, and why didn't God keep this from happening to me? Isn't that the way a lot of folks do? Why am I? I didn't do anything wrong. All I was trying to do was teach people God's Word. All I was trying to do was be a faithful servant of God. Yeah. A lot of our society would ask that question. Why is God letting this happen to me? As if God were at fault. But notice something else. The prisoners heard them. They heard them praying. They heard them singing songs of praise. If you and I had been one of those prisoners, how do you think we might have reacted to that? Do you think it might have stunned us? Knowing that these men had been brought in beaten, they, they were probably drug in, they were cast into the inner prison, they're bloody, they're, they're hurting, they've been put in the inner stocks. Don't you think maybe we might be a little stunned if we were not a Christian ourselves? I like something McGarvey said here. He said, men do not pray when they are enraged or sing when they are in deep distress. I believe he's right. It'd be pretty hard to sing if, if all I'm thinking about is how badly I hurt, wouldn't it? Note what Paul wrote to the Philippians. In Philippians 4, verse 6 and 7, he said, Be careful. The original word here is the idea of anxious. In other words, the idea of worry. Be careful. Do not be anxious. Do not worry for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving and request, be made known unto God, and the peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Paul had experience in this, didn't he? Paul knew what it was to have peace, real peace, 
And real peace is peace with God. Not peace with our fellow man. Oh, it'd be nice to have peace with our fellow man. But real peace is peace with God. And then I'm going to have peace with all others who have peace with God, aren't I? Paul understood that. And Paul and Silas' bodies, now again, they're in agony, they're imprisoned. But think about their soul right now. Someone said their soul was as free as a soaring eagle. And uh, the more I thought about that phrase, I don't remember who said it, but uh, whoever it was that said it, man, what an idea, a concept. Oh, their bodies may have been locked up, but their soul was free to continue doing what God wanted them to do. They still had a mouth. They used it to offer prayers to God and to sing songs. And the prisoners around them were hearing this. What did God do at some point of their praise to Him? He sent an earthquake. Oh, and notice the, the description of this earthquake. It wasn't just an earthquake. I remember one time when we were living in uh, uh, Dayton. Dayton. Thank you. Uh, Dayton, Ohio, there was a little earthquake one day. We'd, we'd laid down to take a little nap on Sunday afternoon before evening worship service, and all of a sudden the bed started moving. Didn't move a lot, but it moved enough where we knew something ain't right. No, this was a great earthquake. This would be like the one that happened in San Francisco years ago that, that almost completely destroy, destroyed San Francisco. This would be one like we've seen in recent times in Turkey and, and, and towns and houses just completely fall flat. Not a little tremor. This would be a high point on the Richter scale. And this earthquake caused all of the prison doors to open. Huh. That earthquake we went through, it didn't open the bedroom door. Still there. Still standing. I guess it's still standing to this day. Open to the door. But wait. I have never heard of an earthquake that would remove the shackles from a prisoner. Have you? Oh, except this one. I've never heard of that happening. Their chains are falling off of them. Their bindings are, are falling off. Even though Paul and, and, and Silas could not have reached to unfasten the stocks at their feet, if they could have gotten the lock off, no more stocks. An earthquake might cause all the doors to fall off, a mighty earthquake. But then again, remember, these were solid walls. But not loose every man's bonds. We're going to come back next week, and we're going to notice the results of their being abused, cast into prison, a great earthquake sent by God to open the doors and to loose all of the prisoners from all of their bonds. Thanks for being with us tonight, and hopefully we've given a few things to think about, and hopefully you don't think I'm some kind of weird radical for what, how we started tonight. <laughs>